the another incident happened which caused Uthman to rethink of another strategy. What was the incident that occurred? Well, the Muslim armies were fighting on the border posts of the Muslim lands in an area that is to this day is called Azerbaijan. And then too it was called Azerbaijan. And what happened was that the Muslims of Mecca and Medina had met with the Muslims of Syria, Damascus, other places. They had all met together on the front lines. And lo and behold, they were reciting the Qur'an differently. And the reasons for this will become clear uh, in another future episode. But they were reciting the Qur'an, each one from a companion, uh, that, and they had slight differences in their recitation. And these Muslims did not realize where these differences came from. Later on we will learn that these differences came from the Prophet ﷺ himself. But these Muslims were unschooled in the recitations of the Qur'an, and they began fighting one another almost to a physical fight. They began saying that my recitation is better, your recitation is wrong, I know how to recite, you are ignorant, even though all of these uh, companions were reciting, all of these, excuse me, people were reciting from the companions' recitations. Now the companions themselves did not fight, they knew where these differences came from. But their students, those who took the Qur'an from them, they were the ones who didn't know where these differences came from. And so they said, my version of the Qur'an is better. And the other said, no, my version of the Qur'an is better. And so, a companion who was present there by the name of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. He said, O Muslims, what are you doing? Are you going to fight like the Jews and Christians fought over their books that they have different versions and different scriptures? O Muslims, this is the one Qur'an of the Prophet ﷺ and these differences are not to the level of different versions, they're different recitations. And so the Muslims understood what was going on and so they stopped fighting amongst themselves. But Hudayfa thought that unless I do something, unless we prevent this from becoming even worse, then the Ummah will start fighting and bickering and each one will then try to form a different version of the Qur'an. On. So he rushed home back to Medina and he entered in upon the Caliph Uthman ibn Affan ta'ala and he said, O Khalifatul Amir, O Amir al Mu'mineen, O leader of the faithful, you must do something to prevent future generations from fighting over the Book of Allah. One group says my version, the other group says my version. You must standardize the Qur'an such that everybody writes the same spelling, the same script, the same pronunciation, everything should be the same. So Uthman ibn Affan called a gathering of all of the companions and Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman spoke to them and explained to them that unless we do something and standardize all of the uh, copies of the Qur'an into one standard copy, then we are going to face difficulties down the line. So all of the companions agreed to this, and so Uthman ibn Affan recalled the Mus'haf that was written by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and he ordered a committee to be formed, and this committee was composed once again of the very same person who was in charge of the first one, that is Zayd ibn Thabit, and then as well, Three or four other members were added who were very knowledgeable of the Arabic language and of the dialect of the Quraysh. And this time Uthman said, make five copies, not just one. And write it in the spelling of the Quraysh, because the Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Quraysh. So write it in the spelling of the Quraysh and make five copies. And so this committee gathered together and within the period of a few months, they made five different copies of the same Mus'haf Abu Bakr, they made five copies. And then Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an sent each copy to one of the famous provinces of the uh, Islamic Empire, the Islamic Caliphate. He sent a copy to Damascus, he sent uh, another copy to uh, Kufa in Iraq. So each of the provinces, they got one of the copies and along with a copy, he sent one of the famous reciters of the Qur'an as well. So along with a physical copy of the Qur'an, he also sent a famous reciter with it. And then he made a general proclamation, a general announcement all over the Muslim Caliphate. And he said, anybody who has any copy of the Qur'an should dispose of it and come and copy the Qur'an from this original copy. Let nobody just copy an unofficial copy because you don't know where that copy came from. So he disposed of all of the Qur'ans. Now when you dispose of the Qur'an, 
we are not supposed to just throw it away in the trash or throw it away in the garbage. No, rather we're supposed to get rid of it in a way that nobody can disrespect it. So of the ways you can dispose of it, you can uh, dip it in, in, in water or in the ocean and the ink would dissolve. This is the old ink we're talking about. And of the ways that you can bury it in a deep, far away uh, place until it decomposes. Because remember, the earliest Qur'ans were written on leather or parchment which decomposes. And of the ways is that you can burn it, not as a sign of disrespect, but rather as a, as a protection of future disrespect. In other words, you get rid of it in a way that other people will not be able to disrespect it. And this is an important factor because when we say that the, the, the Qur'ans were burnt by the early Muslims, from the Western mentality, to burn a book, generally speaking, is to show disrespect to it. But when you do this to the Qur'an, it is to make sure that nobody tramples on it or nobody throws it away. In other words, you get rid of it in a manner that will prevent its disrespect later on. Now, this was what was done that all of the Qur'ans and all of the uh, mushafs of all of the ummah were then taken and disposed of and anybody who wanted a Qur'an had to copy it directly from the Mus'haf of Uthman ibn Affan and that is why we call it the Uthmanic Mus'haf. All future Qur'ans, even up to our times, conform letter for letter, word for word with the Qur'anic Mus'hafs. It was a drastic measure. But it was a necessary measure. And it is due to Uthman, it is due to the efforts of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the Qur'an. To this day, there is no different version of the Qur'an. There is but one Qur'an. And this is due to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he showered on Uthman ibn Affan. And this was done by the unanimous consensus of all of the companions at the time. Now, the Qur'ans at that time were written in a very ancient script. It is called Kufic script. And that script was not uh, having dots or vowels on it. The dots and the tashkils were added later on in the second and third centuries of the Hijrah. And this was done to facilitate the readings of the Qur'an. And it is narrated that the first person to add diacritical marks, i.e. what we call tashkil, the fatha kasra dhamma, the first person to do so was a person by the name of Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali. And Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali uh, was a person who lived uh, in the first century of the Hijrah, and a student of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he used to add dots in specific places to take the place of Fatha Kasra Dhamma. So he would put a dot below the letter if it was a uh, Kasra, a dot above the letter if it was a Fatha, and a dot after the letter if it was a Dhamma. And later on, people began to differentiate between the various letters of the Arabic alphabet. The early script of the Arabic alphabet did not have dots on the letters. So a Fa and a Qaf could only be told apart by context, and a Ba and a Ta and a Tha could only be told apart by context, and a Ha and a Kha could only be told apart by context. Later on, people developed a more sophisticated sophisticated script. And so until our times, the most common script that we use is called the Neskhi script. Now I wanted to show you some of the earliest copies of the Qur'an that we have that are still present in our times. And of the copies of the Qur'an that we have, if we can see on the screen here, And this gives us some examples of the earliest mushafs that were written and they are available to this day. Anybody who wants to compare and compare letter for letter and word for word, they can do so. The Qur'an indeed has been preserved from the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even though the ayat and surah are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain aspects the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also informed us about. And of them is where does an ayah begin and end? The Prophet ﷺ did not sit down and say, this surah has this many ayat. This is very rare. Only once in a while. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah says, this is a verse that is seven. This is a surah that is seven verses. Sab al-Mathani. And uh, for example, in another uh, surah, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a surah in the Quran composed of 30 verses. And he meant Surah Al-Mulk. So sometimes he told us, but most of the time he didn't. Therefore, how did the later scholars decide where to put the endings of the verse uh, numbers? The response, wherever the Prophet ﷺ stopped regularly 
This is what they took to be the ending of a verse. But you see, sometimes he would stop at different places. Sometimes he would run out of breath at one place and other times he wouldn't run out of breath there. So he would stop occasionally on some verses and occasionally not. And this difference of opinion exists to this day in the Ummah. We find certain recitations of the Qur'an, they have slightly different numberings of verses than other recitations. And we'll talk about recitations in a uh, future episode. But for now, I want you to re realize and remember that the number of verses in the Qur'an depends upon the recitation, called in Arabic the qira'a that you are reciting. Now the most common qira'a that people who are living in English-speaking lands in Western countries, most of the world that follows, it is called the qira'a of Hafs and Asim. And this qira'a, qira'a of Hafs and Asim, it has 6,236 verses in the Qur'an. So 6,236 verses according to the qira'a that we recite. And the other uh, recitations, and we are, there are 10 total recitations, they have slightly different numbers. Between 6,210 uh, all the way up to uh, 6,236. So a difference of 20 or 30 verses. That's it. Now when we say difference of verses, it doesn't mean some qira'at have missing verses. No, not at all. The Qur'an is exactly the same word for word, sentence for sentence. The entire Qur'an is the same between the different recitations. But what is different, one uh, recitation might have split a long verse into two. Another recitation might have taken those two verses, made them into one. So what is different is where the verse begins and ends, but not the actual words within the uh, verses. Also realize that the arrangement of the verses is unanimously agreed upon within a surah. The arrangement of the verses, in other words, when you're reciting the, the Qur'an, you're reciting the verses, it is exactly the same in all of the recitations by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam. There is no opinion of a scholar that this verse should go in Surah Baqarah instead of Ali Imran, or this verse should be in Surah Al-Fil instead of Surah Al-Nas, no such thing. All the scholars of Islam unanimously agree about the arrangement of the verses within a surah.